Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Horan. I'm one of your hosts for this ecological silviculture in the context of climate change uh, webinar series. Today, we're really excited to have Dr. Christina Eisenberg. And in just a few minutes, right at one o'clock, you're going to hear about synergistic effects of multiple stressors on forest resistance, resilience, and response. So just hang tight and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jeff Horan. I'm one of the hosts of this um, Ecological Forestry in the Context of Climate Change webinar series. Uh, we're pretty excited today to have Dr. Christina Eisenberg talking about synergistic effects of multiple stressors on forest resistance, resilience, and response. So it's one o'clock, and I'm going to turn it over to Gwyneth da Daunton to take us through a few logistics for today. Thanks, and talk to you in a second. Gwyneth, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Um, welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, here at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. It is currently raining. Um, my name is Gwyneth Daunton, and today's webinar is on the synergistic effects of multiple stressors on forest resil resistance, resilience, and response. Um, we are excited to have Christina Eisenberg with us today, um, who is from Oregon State University uh, College of Forestry. Um, we'll be introducing Christina in just a moment, but first I would like to remind you of a few pre-webinar items. I'd like to start this week's course by sharing NCDC's land acknowledgement with, with all of you. The National Conservation Training Center is located on the ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. Uh, these include, but are not limited to, the Massawomack, Haudenosaunee, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. NCTC is dedicated to building relationships with these indigenous communities, and we encourage others to learn more about the lands where they reside on. I'm happy to share a link to those who are interested where you can learn about the inhabitants of the land that you live and work at. I also want to mention that at NCTC, we welcome all students. My intention here is to create a safe and inclusive, productive webinar environment that honors and supports diverse ideas. 
We are strengthened by the diverse perspectives and identities, and we will foster an environment where everyone can learn a new skill. As such, I will be an ally in events that anyone experiences access issues or feels uncomfortable. You may always reach out to me privately to address your concerns. First, as a disclaimer, um, this product is for educational purposes only. The views, opinions, or positions expressed in this webinar series are those of the guest presenter and do not necessarily reflect the reviews, opinions, or positions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the Department of the Interior. Some of the materials and images may be protected by copyright or may have been licensed to us by a third party and are restricted in their use. The mention of any product names, companies, web links, textbooks, or other references do not imply federal endorsement. This webinar is also recorded and all participants have been muted and will remain that way for the duration of the webinar. This does not mean though that we don't want you to participate. So anytime you can pop up in the chat and please post any questions and please introduce yourself. Um, I'll get the chat up and running in a bit. Um, please feel free to submit questions um, using the chat icon at the bottom of your screen that simply type your answer into the chat box. Make sure to press everyone so everyone can see your chat, not just the presenters. Um, that should be available in the drop down menu. Um, make sure, and then Jeff will be opening up questions halfway through the presentation. And so we'll look forward to that. To be able to view um, the presentation, uh, you can go up to the view, which is the little bit of squares on the top right hand corner of your screen, and you can access different view modes. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our wonderful host, Jeff, um, to tell us a little bit more about the series as well as introduce our lovely speaker today. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I thank you, Gwyneth. So I just wanted to let everyone know that this that this series um, is sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our Ecology Working Group, the Science Applications Program, their Migratory Birds Program, and a special thanks to the National Conservation Training Center for help, for joining with us. But we also have partners at the USDA Northern Forest Climate Hub, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, who has been particularly helpful and the USDA Forest Service. So it's, it's great to work with these different folks uh, to put this webinar series on. And you can see you know, some of the folks there that are involved in this. So if you have series, if you have questions for us, you can reach out to me. My email's there. Or you can reach out to Gwyneth with technical questions. But we also have CEU credits and, and credits from the Wildlife Society. And in that case, you'd want to reach out to Jim Siegel. Next slide, please, Gwyneth. Okay, thanks. So this happens to be the third of our 12 part monthly webinar series. And this also happens to be the third webinar in this particular 12 part webinar series. And this one, this tells the story of how small and large scale forest disturbance, such as fire, wind, ice storms, sea level rise, flooding, and introduced and endemic forest pests and other disturbances impact forest ecosystems. The series will also examine ecological silviculture and climate adaptation approaches to help inform forest and wildlife management. I also wanted to give, while we have you all here, a little bit of a commercial for our upcoming webinar on December 19th. Um, and in this case, it's forest disturbance and its relationship to wildlife habitat. And we're really fortunate to have as our speaker, Dr. Brenda McComb. And, and Dr. McComb has helped us put this webinar series on since its beginning, so we greatly appreciate that. And you can see she's going to be talking about structure and composition, forest disturbance impacts on, on habitat, et cetera. So with that, next slide, please, Gwyneth. I hope you can join us on December 19th. So as I mentioned, we're really, we're super pleased to have Dr. Christina Eisenberg and Dr. Eisenberg is currently the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence and the Maybell Clark McDonald Director of Tribal Initiatives and Natural Resources. She's also a Professor of Practice at Oregon State University College of Forestry, so not just a Dean. So Christina received her BFA in painting, so she's an artist, 
I haven't seen that yet though, from the University of California, Long Beach, her MA in conservation biology from Prescott College and her PhD in forestry and wildlife from Oregon State University. Notice both forestry and wildlife. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Oregon State University where she studied the food web relationships of wolves, elk, and fire, and the role of indigenous knowledge and cultural burning in ecocultural restoration prior to her post, her current position as associate dean in the College of Forestry. She was also chief scientist at Earthwatch Institute and directed global research on 50 projects in six continents before coming to her current position. So, Finally, her research and professional focus has been on directing Indigenous and Natural Resource Office, Indigenous and Natural Resource Office and Traditional Ecological Knowledge Lab. As a Native American, Ramamuri and Western Apache, and as a Latinx ecologist, she is the lead principal investigator on long-term federal projects with Indigenous communities in Montana and Oregon, where she is working on federal land and tribal land to braid together indigenous knowledge and Western science in ecocultural restoration of forests and grasslands. And she studies how to bring those two together synergistically to increase climate resiliency. So with that, really excited to hear Christina tell some stories about how this comes together. And I'll also mention she's pretty engaged in policy, uh, even down at, at the White House. So that's, that's important for our community. Thanks, Christina, and take it away, please. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that um, good introduction. And thank you, Gwyneth, for the welcome. Okay. Um, okay. Does everybody see my slides? Yes. Right now, we're seeing the full slide view, so we're seeing all your slides. Okay, hang on. Yeah. All right. Now we're seeing your presenter view. Okay, wonderful. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Christina. We're still seeing we're still seeing your presenter view, not the. Yeah. We're not seeing the full slide. Sorry. Let's see. Um, we practice this, everyone, so we know how to do this. It's not letting me uh, switch modes. Uh, if you stop sharing again, maybe, and, and reassign the, there you go, we're seeing you. Okay, are you seeing, what are you seeing now? Just, just, just you. Okay. So I'm going to um, move this to the other monitor and share screen. You still see? There, there you go. You got it. Way to okay. go. Wonderful. Thank you for your patience, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, relationships in forest ecosystems and um, broken relationships and how we can heal those relationships to build relationship, to in increase uh, resilience to, uh, to stressors that are related to climate change. I loved your land acknowledgement. Uh, here is mine. And basically a land acknowledgement is just an insult that says we stole your land, unless 
you take it to the next step. So this is beyond the land acknowledgement. I'm committed to taking people and the institutions with whom I work beyond the land acknowledgement to find ways to support and empower Native Americans and their communities. I'm mindful of the truth that for thousands of years, the Mary's River or Ampinapu Band of the Kalkuya have been in relationship with the land where Oregon State University in Corvallis now sits and I now live and work. I acknowledge that they were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon and that their living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. I value the long and deep interactions they have with the land and aspire to find ways to honor and manifest that value in my work and life. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the impacts and effects of multiple stressors on forest systems and adaptive strategies for managing forests with, that are experiencing multiple stressors and collaborative work with tribes and indigenous knowledge. The image you see here is of one of my study sites in Southwest Alberta. That is a forest that burned in a high severity mega fire, a fire of such um, extreme severity that it removed about a half meter of soil. I know that because um, we had established 2000 plots in this site that we had been uh, studying over the years and we had the, some of them were marked with rebar. So we were, and the rebar was positioned. This is a national park, Waterton Lakes National Park, so that only a certain amount of it was exposed above the soil surface so as to not um, mar the visitor experience. Um, those rebar markers came in so useful in telling the story of this fire. Um, that's an aspen forest, um, a pretty high density stand that an aspen is among the most fire resistant species of trees. That tells you how severe this fire was. What it revealed are the bones of long extinct bison, bison antiquus, what became extinct over 10,000 years ago. Uh, Clovis points about uh, 5,000 archeological sites in this park. This is an image of that fire. And the NDVI map, uh, it mapped out at about 87% high severity. It is the, of, of all the fires that have burned in North America in uh, recorded history, um, it had the highest severity. It was uniform, very uniform. And I was in the field with my field crew when that fire broke out and we were evacuated from it twice. That's the wall of flame that was um, several kilometers long and about 700 meters tall, and it was burning down slope. Um, this was not an anomaly. That fire occurred in 2017. At the time, it felt like an anomaly, but then came the 2020 Labor Day fires in Oregon, and the conditions were similar. So the Kenai wildfire in Canada, the humidity was um, less than 1%. The temperature was about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And the wind was blowing um, at, about, um, at about 70 miles per hour. And uh, the, the there was lots and lots of fuel on the ground because there had been a very wet spring and a dry summer. Um, in the Labor Day fire situation, there were similar relationships and, uh, you know, drought and drought stress. And what happened was there was a windstorm that blew down power lines and sparked all these fires all at once, all in the same weekend. And within four days, they had blown up into mega fires. Um, see, this is the Harvard forest. And what you see here is the mortality caused by woolly adelgid moth and decline in shifts in water resources. I was there recently and um, the trees the, in this forest are in deep trouble, it's not just the hemlock, it is maples and oaks. And it's predicted that in within a very short while that um, many of the trees in this forest will have died. 
Um, there's also introduced diseases, um, a variety of factors, and then, um, and then of course, climate change. So to what are we doing about this? Well, uh, my colleague Susan Pritchard and I were asked to lead um, a report for the White House on the state of the science of our nation's, what we know about our nation's forests, how they're being affected by these synergistic stressors and what are some of the things that we can do about as part of proactive management and stewardship. So the problem, North American forests are experiencing unprecedented challenges due to extreme wildfires, pathogen and insect outbreaks, heat stress, drought, rapid development and invasive species. This is across the United States and across North America, really. Exacerbated by climate change, these threats collectively diminish economic values, cultural values, and habitat, particularly because of fire exclusion, contemporary and historical management policies are root causes of current forest conditions. Our report summarizes findings that braid together indigenous knowledge and Western science to support climate adaptation of forest landscapes. Our writing team is quite diverse. And we build on federal initiatives and directives to respectfully and intentionally braid indigenous knowledge and Western science systems in a two-eyed seeing approach. So this report, um, it was, uh, it, it's a diverse group. So we, they wanted, the White House federal leaders wanted an indigenous led decolonized report. There's 30 co-authors, a third of us are indigenous. Um, they wanted us to present tribal forestry perspectives on how to steward forests for resiliency. We are rethinking the idea of forest reserves. Um, basically all of the forest management practices that have been in place for over a hundred years, initiated by Gifford Pinchot in his visionary effort, and whether they fit where we're at today and what we can do to create more proactive synergistic strategies for conserving these forests. So we are recommending active stewardship um, the report will be finished and published by December 31st. Um, it will be presented at the Society of American Forester Science Summit in Washington, D.C. in March of 2024, and it's intended to inform federal policy. Um, I would like to share a story. This picture really tells you where we're at. Um, so I'm in a moist forest, that's me on, in the purple jacket on the far right, and Jerry Franklin, Dr. Jerry Franklin, the father of old growth forest is with me. And a uh, forest service, um, sorry, BLM leadership. This was a field trip on BLM ONC lands, uh, Oregon and California railroad lands. Um, Abe Wheeler is uh, the lead forester for those lands for the state of Oregon. And um, Andrew Marshall is uh, one of the co-authors of our report, actually, and he so is Abe. And Andrew is an early career fire ecologist who is reconstructing fire history throughout um, the West. So uh, I was there with this team to look at um, a study site for our project that I'll talk about later, BLM uh, project that incorporates indigenous knowledge and Western science. And I was asked by uh, the lead, uh, the, the district office lead, so Christina, how would you restore this forest? There is a bunch of Douglas fir toothpick trees that are dying. They have um, dying from drought stress. Uh, you can see them in the background. There's this old cedar tree. And, um, and she said, and by the way, there's a northern spotted owl nest in this stand. How would you fix this? So this is a highly at-risk forest for, um, for fire because of all of the standing uh, dying trees that are in its closed, completely closed canopy. And I said, well, I said, first, I would um, bring in some elders, tribal elders, 
And I would ask them to tell me the stories of this forest and what it once looked like. With the uh, Kino fought wildfire in Canada, the elders had been sharing stories about what that forest looked like before and that there were big herds of bison in there, which um, Western scientists said, oh, this is not bison habitat. And the wildfire revealed there were thousands and thousands of bones of bison um, that were revealed. So in this situation, I said, first, I would listen to the elders and have them you know, help me create a reference site for restoration purposes based on their traditional ecological knowledge. I would then thoroughly do a survey using best Western science methods of the um, ecological characteristics of that stand, the overstory, understory, um, wildlife um, species present, um, diversity indices, all sorts of things, looking at the soil. Then I said I would um, identify the culturally significant plants in the understory and collect seeds of them to be used for restoration efforts. Um, then I would do a very respectful, intentional, uh, careful thinning using ecological forestry um, perspectives. And to get that stand more to this historical condition based on what both Western science and the stories that the elders had shared, then I would burn it, do a very low severity um, cultural burn. And then the following growing season, I would plant the seeds of those culturally significant plants in the soil because those seeds are uh, nitrogen fixing species that greatly boost many of them, the nitrogen cycle, and they help uh, rebuild the soil. So that is, that is what that forest told me sitting there. And the other part of this, before you do anything, you sit with the forest and, and you listen to what it has to say. That's in the indigenous worldview. So this is, how things were done before, before um, when this was all Indian country. The image on the left is of the Willamette Valley. It's a, um, was once much more open looking than it looks today. Today, there's a lot of conifers in there and closed canopy forests. Um, this is a painting from 1845. That land was kept open with cultural burning. The image on the right is from uh, Alberta, um, Blackfoot burning the prairie, and it's from the National Archives. So Frank Lake in 2017 uh, wrote um, a great paper about this that I highly recommend. So what I've been talking about is indigenous knowledge and the preferred definition of it is by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's knowledge and practices passed orally from generation to generation and formed by strong cultural memories, sensitivity to change, and values that include reciprocity. It's spiritual. It's cultural. Language is deeply tied to it. It's a way of life. And it contrasts strongly with the European worldview, um, you know, that was based on economics as the principal driver of their relationship with nature. Indigenous knowledge is also referred to as traditional ecological knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is the current um, preferred term based on consultation with tribal leaders by the White House. Um, it incorporates um, at its core the seventh generation principle that the things that you do um, today should sustain be sustainable seven generations into the future and should also be based on things that were done seven generations into the past. So settler colonialism, before we can move forward, it's important to understand what happened. The policy definition of it is that it's the policy of a foreign polity seeking to re extend or retain its authority over other people or territories to develop or exploit them to benefit the colonizing country and help the colonies modernize in terms defined by the colonizers. That's the Oregon Trail. These are the impacts of settler colonialism. 
And you see that pile of bison skulls. Um, you see the clear cut in Oregon and one of the Klamath dams in Oregon that is um, one of the dams that is about to be removed. Underneath all of this uh, economics driven European style development, there were policies that were created but were not fully implemented or respected. The Dawes Act gave tribes sovereignty, meaning each federally recognized tribe is a sovereign nation, the same as one would work with, let's say, France or England in any type of endeavor, that level of sovereignty. And also that indigenous people have the right of self-governance and self-determination, this has never until recently been implemented in a uniform way. Um, in the 1950s through 1960s, um, there was an attempt to terminate federal recognition of tribes and any federal assistance to tribes. So the assistance policies were created because of all of the stolen Indian land. So tribes were put on reservations with the understanding that the federal government would provide financial assistance with things like agriculture and health. Um, Indian termination was about, you know, we've helped you long enough, now you can be on your own. And all of this denies the fact that 90% of uh, Native Americans either died from diseases introduced by Europeans or were killed uh, through genocide. In 1975 and 1994, well, the Indian termination failed, and then uh, some new laws were passed that strengthened um, the acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. Um, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act of 1975 and the Tribal Self-Governance Act of 1994. They reinstated these night rights, but until the last three or four years, Securing these rights in practice has been very challenging. And settler colonialism remains prevalent regardless of institutional DEI mandates in uh, most places. We're in a new era because of this person. This is Secretary Halland. It's a new era for indigenous knowledge and sovereignty rights and social justice. Soon after she was sworn in, um, we developed some federal policies. And I think this is a good place to stop for questions. Um, Jeff? Thanks, uh, Christina, for, for stopping there. And again, uh, very interesting stuff. So, so there are a couple questions um, in in the chat, and one relates to the catastrophic fire that you showed up front that you indicated as primarily Aspen, but the comment was that it appeared that there that we were seeing conifers, and you explained that to me earlier. So can you explain what we were actually seeing and, and the um, what the fire burned, you know, started in the Aspen, but I think it ended up in... Um, the fire... You know, the fire started in the conifers and it burned down, uh, you know, so the conifers were at higher elevation, uh, so subalpine zone, montane zone, and then into the foothills parkland, so it burned down into the aspen. Um, I showed an image of aspen that were burned, but conifers were burned similarly um, down to the nubs like that. Yeah, that looked like a very, that looked like an extremely hot fire. And so, and you also mentioned that um, you had listened to the forest um, when you were out with that group and, and you had talked about planting nitrogen fixing species. Can you explain just a little more about what you were, you know, trying to accomplish there? In other words, are you starting almost to prepare the site or are you starting with early successional species or how, you know, um, what's the forest telling you there? So the understory species are, um, some of them uh, initiate is post-fire as early successional species, um, but they remain present in mature, in the understory of 
mature forests that are being managed um, using, um, you know, stewarded using cultural practices of burning. So the burning keeps those species, um, you know, vit vitally, you know, very actively reproducing, sprouting and growing. <laughs> those species provide essential habitat for deer and elk. Um, I'm not allowed to name what those species are because they're culturally significant and they're protected by sovereignty rights. Oh, interesting. Um, but um, if you look at what are, you know, the preferred diet of deer and elk or woody browse species, many of them would pop up. There's also some grasses in there as well that are preferred browse for um, forage for elk, for example. Great. So that, that's really helpful. So I have one more that I know you can answer quickly. And so we'll, I don't want to hold you up any longer. We'll let you get back to the presentation. But a couple of people know. So, so Ted Weber asked, so, hey, what's the, you know, they're recognizing that braiding sweet grass is, a, you know, Robin Walkimer book. Um, and so they're asking, you know, what's the link between braid, um, braiding and indigenous knowledge and, and braiding sweet grass and the report. So can you? So uh, say that again, please. So there's a number of folks have noticed and recognized braiding sweet grass as, you know, a wonderful book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, but they're trying to understand the link between that and, and the report. So if you could, if you could share. Yeah. Um, the, the slides I'm going to present next will explain that better, but um, basically, uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, there's a quote in her book that inspired this, and she's a close colleague of mine. Um, so you have a braid of sweet grass. There's three strands that are braided together. Um, she sees that as a metaphor for healing our broken relationship with nature. And what that means is that one strand is science, is Western science. And like me, she is a very formally trained Western scientist. The other strand is traditional or indigenous knowledge. What brings them together is the third strand and that's spirit. So what, what brings us together across all cultural, um, boundaries, political boundaries, um, what brings us all together, what builds community, and why we're here in this webinar today is that we're all equally concerned about what's happening with our nation's forests, with wildlife species, with, you know, on a landscape scale, with ecosystems. Um, it's rather unprecedented the megafires we're having today, for example. That's one example. Um, and so the spirit is that we have this, this common concern, deep concern, and we want to find a solution. We want to find a better way. So braiding sweetgrass means you bring those together with this common concern across cultures, and that's where you find those synergistic paths forward. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the great answer. We'll take some more questions at the very end. And you guys can start putting questions in the chat uh, all along the way. So I see some are coming in. Thank you. Go ahead, Christina. Okay. So, so how do we braid sweetgrass? That's what the next slides are all about. Um, and really, here's the federal policy context about uh, self-determination. In uh, this happened really fast. In July 21, uh, there was the Presidential Justice 40 initiative. Um, and, and then in November 21, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ, issued a memorandum on what at that time was referred to as ITEK, Indigenous Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Federal Decision Making. And so the um, the CEQ, this is this is a very powerful body. Uh, they are take the national lead in addressing climate change. 
they take the national lead, the OSTP and CEQ, in um, con allocation of funding for federal agencies. So they they lead, you know, establishing the budgets for federal agencies and through Congress, you know, making funds available. They work directly with the president and his cabinet. And so um, they they issued this memorandum saying that um, every agency must incorporate indigenous knowledge in their decision-making process. Then in 20, 2022, the White House OSTP CEQ issued a memo guidance on indigenous knowledge. At that point, they had hosted a gathering of um, indigenous leaders and I was part of that and they asked, what should we call it? So they asked us, they didn't presume to tell us what it should be. They said, okay, we, is it TEK? Is it ITEK? And um, the consensus was that indigenous knowledge is the preferred term. So at that point it started being referred to as that. In 2022, there was a joint secretarial order. So this is an order 3403, that there's a trust responsibility to tribes in stewardship of federal lands and waters. This means tribes must be involved in the form of co-stewardship or co-management agreements, if that's what tribes want, in stewardship of lands and waters. That in, this involves everything related to those lands and waters, wildlife, forests. Um, it's, this is huge. It extends to marine environments, um, all, all types of, of habitat landscapes. So, but nobody really knows how to do this. How do we braid sweetgrass? It's one thing to say, okay, everybody go braid sweetgrass. So how do you do it? And our report that we're working on is part of helping, um, helping provide guidance on how to do this. And we have done multiple White House briefings as part of working on our report, our core group, um, addressing questions like, how do we do this? There have been several White House field trips out into some of the most at-risk forests um, in the West, places that have experienced multiple fires, um, places that my colleague Susan Pritchard uh, has studied for years in Washington State. Um, some sites in Montana. So these, these federal policy leaders want to understand, want to get their boots on the ground and understand what the heck is going on here. Why are we in crisis? And what do we, what can we do about this? So to braid sweetgrass, first, you're dealing with two very different worldviews. The um, Western worldview is egocentric. And so um, Gifford Pinchot um, founded the Forest Service and Teddy Roosevelt uh, created the National Park Service and both have two very different missions. Um, one is, but what unites them is they're both egocentric, assuming that man, humans, can control everything in a top-down way, either by protecting it or by taking on um, what was enormously progressive at the time, you know, a sustained yield perspective. So the ecocentric, which is the indigenous worldview, is that humans are embedded in nature and we're not just embedded in nature, so we can't be separated from nature. Like, you know, the protected reserves perspective is humans, we can set ourselves apart from nature, but we're still in control. Um, the ecocentric view and the indigenous perspective is that we're embedded in nature. And not only that, we're the dumbest organism in nature. So a sedge knows more than we do about how to live well and rightly. And that if we pay attention, if we listen with cultural humility, we might learn how to live better, how to do the right thing. So I recall the story I shared about being in the forest um, with Jerry Franklin and BLM 
of leaders. And the first thing I said, well, first I would sit in the forest and listen to what it has, what it's telling me. And what I saw there, the forest was saying, I'm in trouble, I need help. So um, anyway, so these are the two worldviews. One is based on um, the economy being kind of embedded, but not the most important thing versus um, the egocentric is equally driven by people's needs, economics, and the needs of nature. I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's a chasm between Indigenous knowledge, values, and perspectives, and Western science. So, you know, a key one is diachronic. Indigenous knowledge is long duration. Western science tends to be short time series, synchronic. There are some exceptions like the LTER, long-term ecological research sites. Um, indigenous knowledge is humans are part of nature. Western science is uh, humans are outside of nature and we are studying nature. Um, indigenous knowledge is very community-based. You know, the whole community of people are involved like elders and children. Um, and in Western science, it's driven by scientists who are specialists and often come from the outside. Um, indigenous knowledge is part of every breath we take. And in the Western world, um, Western science needs to be unbiased and you know, separate from what we're studying. We have these ideas and then we apply them. How do you bring them together? Well, uh, Reed et al. created this model and Reed as a wildlife biologist, this was for fisheries work in Canada. Um, uh, and it was the concept of two-eyed seeing was actually created in Canada um, for in, in the education field because people were finding that indigenous students did not do well using into, uh, education systems that um, non-Indigenous students did well on. And so why didn't it work? Why didn't this same system not work for Indigenous students? And so they started coming up with, well, maybe it has to do with worldviews and they consulted elders. And so this was a co-developed concept to I'd seen. So it's a circular framework. Um, you go round and round the cycle. It's not linear. You and it's intended to build deep relationships around addressing whatever um, issue. And we can look at natural resource issues, for example. You know how how do we restore resiliency to um, forests that are um, dying or burning up? And so we we come up with a mutual interest, we identify required tools, we co-develop research and co-evaluate um, the whole community is involved, including children and elders. Um, and is this working? Do we need to change this? And there need to be co-benefits. And th this is a long-term thing. So it's not a two-year project and then you're done. So here is an example. This is Camas restoration um, with the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes in Northwest Montana. This is a very successful project in partnership with the Forest Service. Um, this was a forest that um, was closed canopy, um, high fire risk, had you know very fire prone. Um, it's um, a mixed forest, Douglas fir, um, lodgepole, some ponderosa, but it's not a pure ponderosa stand. And um, I think it's dominated by Doug fir, this particular stand. And what they did was they did um, a thinning using ecological forestry methods. Then, then they burned it with a low severity cultural burn. And um, almost immediately the camas started sprouting from buried seed banks. And camas is a hugely significant species to that, um, through tribes throughout um, the Pacific Northwest into the inland West. 
it is a primary food species. Um, camas root is used to uh, was used to create flour. So um, basically, to bridge this chasm, you um, you bring together indigenous knowledge and Western science by doing ecocultural restoration. So you partner together using that two-eyed seeing model. Ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. I'm on the board of the Society for Ecological Restoration and have been for many years. And my role there is to um, has been to develop the ecocultural restoration aspect. And we set the standard, the global standards for restoration. So to define ecocultural restoration. It's the process of restoring key historic pre-contact, pre-industrial ecosystems, structures, processes, and functions. So you can't go back, but you can recreate the relationships that may have once been there. The ecological relationships and also the human relationships with the natural world. And it's also... It involves restoring the indigenous cultural practices that shaped ecosystems with which plant communities co-evolved across millennia. So a bit about my work, I lead the indigenous natural resource um, office at the College of Forestry, and this is an endowed office. And I lead the traditional ecological knowledge lab um, the Indigenous Natural Resource Office in the lab is an indigenized gathering place to develop relationships and allyships across cultures. I believe allyships are critical, that we need each other across cultures to figure things out, to support each other. So that's what our office and our lab do. And by creating these partnerships that honor sovereignty rights and government to government relationships, we're helping decolonize and re-indigenize the practice of science and advance holistic systems-based thinking. We're braiding together multiple ways of knowing to empower tribal nations, create opportunities for tribal youth in higher ed, and to find solutions to some of humanity's most pressing conservation challenges. I created a task force as part of my job at Oregon State University in the College of Forestry um, to develop principles and best practices for working with indigenous knowledge and partnering with tribal nations. And there's a link to it, and it's also being shared in the chat. Um, basically, you start by acknowledging historical context of past injustices. So acknowledge the genocide acknowledge that land was taken and that it, it began to be managed in ways that were very different, such as by excluding cultural practices like cultural burning. Where I'm from in Montana, I lived in Montana for many years, uh, the penalty for cultural burning was death. And there was a massacre in the valley, the Swan Valley of Montana, where we still have a cabin and where we lived for 30 years. Um, because uh, some uh, Kootenai uh, tribal members were burning the forest as part of their hunting practices, and they were killed. So um, acknowledge those things and then move forward in to, to heal the land and to heal ourselves. So you start early. You don't wait till you have a proposal in hand and then approach a tribe. You are transparent and open at all times respect different processes and worldviews, uh, the indigenous worldview, there, there is such a thing as Indian time, it's real. It's a nonlinear way of doing things. Um, understand that that needs to be honored. Recognize and respond to challenges with cultural humility and there will be challenges. Um, consider co-stewardship and co-management partnerships, particularly if this involves a, a federal or state agency. Support co-production of knowledge. That means um, joint authorship on journal articles and reports. Provide ample funding for tribal nations at each step of the partnership. So that's something that often doesn't happen. And then 
share power and decision-making authority with tribal partners. So it's a true partnership. And I'm working very closely with federal and state leaders um, to, uh, on how this can be implemented, but these um, principles have been, um, the CEQ has them now. They've been shared widely among federal leaders and these are considered um, you know, one of the things that they're using to develop, uh, deepen the policies that they have for engagement with tribal nations. So quickly, um, there's two projects that I lead um, with uh, several co-PIs. One of my co-PIs is Tom DeLuca, the Dean of the College of Forestry, um, who's a soil scientist, a, an amazing soil scientist. Um, so there is a three-year ethnobotany seed collection and tribal conservation core eco-cultural restoration pilot project working in the forest in Western Oregon with five tribal nations. And this is uh, through the Native Plant Conservation Program. Peggy Allwell is the director of that. Um, and we had our first field season last summer and it was amazing. So later today, I'm gonna be out in the field with one of these tribes planning um, with Tom DeLuca and my grad students to plan the next field season. And then in the Northern Plains, um, the, I, I lead a nine-year ethnobotany and seed collection and Tribal Conservation Corps Ecocultural Restoration Project. Um, I was asked to testify in Congress about this project. It's considered a model for um, restoring resiliency to grassland ecosystems. Last summer, um, uh, the director of the BLM uh, Tracy Stone Manning joined us in the field, me and Tom DeLuca and our field crew um, to see what we were doing because it is considered a national model. And uh, this project started in 2019. Um, it's sim the project in Oregon is, is modeled after this one. It's a very different ecosystem, but the base fundamentals are the same, a uh, strong involvement of tribal youth collecting seeds and doing a very detailed ecological surveys. And then most of the funding going straight into the indigenous communities with which we work. So forests of the future, what do we want to see? Um, I recommend the Hagman et al paper um, where she highlights how departed today's forests are from forests a couple hundred years ago. And due to a, a many different factors, not just fire suppression. So, and I leave you with this question, what could holistic forest management that includes indigenous knowledge and Western science look like? Okay, so um, I'm able to answer questions if people have questions. Yeah, there are certainly some questions that have that have come in, and so I'll, I'll start with a general one. Well, here here's two questions that I think are in the same place, and I'm going to start with the one that's general. But then, if you'll if you'll hang on, I'm going to add, I'm going to um, pile on with a, a very specific one. So Catherine asks, what is one recommendation or action you have for public land managers to begin incorporating indigenous knowledge? into forest management plans. So I'll let you think about that for a second. So again, it, this is just asking for one recommendation or action for public managers to begin incorporating IK into forest management plans. And then Rebecca asks a very specific question about working for um, a fish and wildlife organization. She focuses on uh, listed species, listed endangered species, and she reviews harvest. So she wants to figure out how to work with the Forest Service. And I'm not sure whether this is a state agency or a federal one, but it says many of these areas are also slated for extensive thinning, burning, commercial and commercial harvest in pursuit to some extent of ameliorating increased wildlife threat. Often I feel a tension between what appears to be a blunt application of wildfire mitigation and protecting habitat for listed species, which is her responsibility. Can you speak to this tension in light of your work? 
Do you have any suggestions or tips on achieving greater cooperation and understanding among what often feels like competing objectives? And this, I believe, is in the East. So less federal land, although, um, but still the same kind of conflicts. So that is a great question. And that really is at the heart of our report. And that's what um, I'm deeply immersed in. Uh, I suggest you may want to attend the SAF um, Science Summit um, in March, because I know that that will be, that question will be at the forefront there. And I don't have a clear answer for it other than we need to reset our way of thinking and think together across cultures. So I was one of the folks that back in the early 90s, I strongly supported the Northwest Forest Plan as being absolutely essential. And I was living in Montana at the time and I saw what was happening to Montana forests and that you know, sustained yield can mean many different things. And, and I saw, I'm a wildlife biologist, and um, I saw what was happening to, you know, species that were threatened or at risk and controversies over species like the lynx, um, for example. And I wrote a book about that, The Carnivore Way, and I wrote another book, The Wolf's Tooth, where I talked about these challenges. So what we did was we... We went too far in two different directions. Um, we removed native people from their traditional lands. We then implemented European-based agriculture practices and wildlife management practices that did not work in Europe. That's why America was colon what is today America was colonized because they had clear they have they were out of wood. They had clear cut all their forests and changed the soil structure so um, and chemistry so that trees were no longer growing well. Um, they had wiped out their game species. And so they came to North America to start again by applying the same practices. And Pinchot did great work at saying, hold on now, we really need to think about how we do this. And his was mainly an economic model. And then Roosevelt said, well, let's protect as much as we can as well. So neither of those worked. And what, what protection does is it says, okay, this system is degraded, let's protect it and leave it alone. That works for a while. But the problem is that um, humans have never been separate from nature, really. And that uh, these forests in every ecosystem co-evolved with humans using the resources in that system in a way that was done with respect and caring and reciprocity, those indigenous values that I mentioned. So stewardship means taking care of a forest the way you would take care of your family. That doesn't mean not using trees, but it means being very mindful and using a seventh generation approach. So right now we're realizing that as, as um, was explained to me by a forest service leader, um, Gifford Pinchot and his best friend Roosevelt, they did this grand experiment. One was protect and one was conserve, right? And use best science to study them both and to make management decisions. And guess what? The experiment failed. That was the grand experiment. So here we are today, and some of the images I showed you of forests in trouble and um, mega fires. So, and then the pathogens that are affecting the forests in uh, the Northeast. Um, what are we going to do? Well, we need a new way of thinking. And we, I believe that we are in that place, one of those portals in natural resource. Um, management and stewardship, where we are coming together to find, you know, a synergistic path forward, which is the same thing that Roosevelt and Pinchot did and Leopold tried to do. Um, and so we're at another one of those junctures with our natural resources, and it's being driven by anthropogenic climate change and 
and how it affects everything else and uh, stressors that are typically part of any ecosystem are all being exacerbated by climate change. The other Thanks. question was about the management plans. That is also a great question. And that is one of the things that we are going to be recommending in our report is that a tribal engagement um, needs to happen as early as possible and needs to be part of things like management plans. Right now, the uh, FACA Committee for Maternal Growth Forest has several um, indigenous people on it. Um, most of them are scientists. And it is an example of how at that level, this is being done. I'm aware that several of our nation's forests, the management plans for some forests are very dated, like over 20 years old for some of them, and they need to be updated. And in updating it, assemble a working committee that uh, honors tribal sovereignty. So tribal members are not stakeholders, like a member of the general public. They are in a, a separate, um, they have a separate legal standing and find ways to truly engage them in part of the uh, planning process. Great, so, so thank you for that. And I, I see some folks have added, there were some questions in about the Hagman paper. There was other questions about the, the North Lab uh, committee. And so people have put in links um, to those. So I appreciate that. And I, uh, and I know we are past the two o'clock hour, but I'm going to ask just one more question. So folks are free to leave, of course, and thanks for joining us. But if you have a minute or two, Christine, Christina, there's another question or two. And this one, I'm going to ask one that's Again, two that are linked, and and one. Um, hang on here, one second. Let me find where it is. Okay, so you know there was discussion about um, Ted. Ted mentioned there was discussion about going back to tribal elders to ask about you know site conditions prior to any restoration, and in other words, to find out you know what were the previous conditions. But he also mentioned then climate change. And Casey comes back to that same question and asks it pretty succinctly. How would you balance restoring ecosystems to a historic structure known from indigenous knowledge against managing for resilience to climate change? In other words, how do you balance those things going back, you know, setting your objective based on historic knowledge or indigenous knowledge and then combining the, the you know the changing ecosystems that we're facing due to climate change. Well, basically they're the same thing. So a, a tenet of indigenous knowledge is that this awareness that the world is constantly changing, and so a static um, way of uh, stewarding, which is the indigenous term uh, in the Western world, it's managing anything will not work well. It, there needs to be agility, flexibility, adaptability built into um, whatever you do. And in, in the indigenous world is every day you go into the forest, if it's a forest or the grassland and you see it with new eyes. And every day you'll, you'll if you're paying attention, you will see uh, something will, well, you will see what you have to do and it's going to be different. So how do we build that into Western management plans? Um, I think that, that native people were keenly aware of climate change. It was not anthropogenically driven at that point, but the climate changed and it changed frequently um, and they adapted to it with using their indigenous knowledge. So, um, we believe, those of us working on this report, that indigenous knowledge is climate change adaptation if it is truly incorporated in a model that involves Western science, which is in a, such a powerful tool, and, and then the, the philosophy, the, the view of the world that comes from indigenous knowledge, which is the world is always changing. A static definition of things is not going to be helpful in the long run. So how do we 
maintain this dynamic relationship with nature. Does that answer your question? I think that's I think that fits great. And if you can take one more, I'm gonna again, there's some other questions in here, but and I think you answered many of them in the talk. But this one is this is Matt, and he's specifically reaching back to the uh, the Camus restoration, where you talk about that particular uh, cultural, you know, important cultural species. And in that point, um, it's indicating that in that discussion, you mentioned ecological thinning, as he thinks was the term you used. And he says, I assume that is distinct from commercial thinning. Can you describe uh, the difference in the specific approach to ecological yeah. thinning? Um, I did not include slides in this presentation from um, some of that type of thinning that we did on our forest land in Montana. Um, so it's variable retention harvest done in with paying attention to um, what ecological um, structures might have been in in a forest in um, you know prior to settlement. And often one can access um, photographs and paintings. In, the, in Alberta, for example, there's a lot of photographs of what those photo forests used to look like in the 1800s. Um, and so it's, it's variable retention harvest, but done with great, you know, paint, creating that complexity of structure. So we did a VRT on our land, which had a closed canopy. And it was where the Kootenai had been stopped from burning. And there's a lot of historical photographs that show how open that forest used to be. Um, within three months, lynx showed up. And it, they're supposed to be lynx. They're not listed as threatened or endangered. It's very controversial, right? Because they're, that listing would greatly affect forest management. Um, but what we did was we created a variety of structures. We kept all the old trees. We removed a lot of the toothpick trees and left clumps of trees. So lynx showed up and I'd be on my, I'd never seen them there in 30 years. And I'm, I'm a carnivore biologist and I've tracked them and studied them a bit. And, but it's like on our land that I know so well, I'd never seen them before. But the thinning also brought in um, increased wolf activity, increased um, deer and elk activity. Um, it was like the whole, the wildlife were just celebrating the thinning that we did. I'd be on a Zoom call from my desk in the second floor of my cabin, looking out onto our land, and there would go a wolf or there would go a cougar chasing deer. And, and you know, this open forest structure, it was like, I'm, I'm going to sound a bit unprofessional here, but it was like a party going on on our land with the wildlife celebrating like, yes, we love this forest structure. So that's an example of ecological forestry. Um, Norm Johnson and Jerry Franklin wrote a book about it, Ecological Forestry, um, that I highly recommend if you want to learn more about it. Yeah, great. Uh, great recommendation. And so with that, Christina, I think we should wrap things up, but thanks so much for a great presentation. And I can see there's also hunger. We got a chance to talk a lot about the indigenous knowledge component and a lot about the, the ways we're trying to um, link and weave those, you know, braiding the sweetgrass. We didn't get it, but clearly you have a pretty deep knowledge about variable retention of harvest and ways to get these things done on the ground. We just didn't get to talk about every piece of that. So maybe we're going to have to have you back in the future to get down into the into the dirt um, uh, about those things in the future. Because we have I'm hunger. We have hunger for both. You know, we have hunger for both. So thanks so much. And thanks to to all our participants. I think we had around 400 I got I saw 420 folks at least. So plenty of folks out there interested in what you had to say. So thanks so much for taking the time, Christina, and thanks so much to our participants. And we'll see, hope to see folks on December 19th when we hear from Dr. Brenda McCone about impacts on wildlife. All right. Thanks so much. And again, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Doug, for hosting me. And everybody take care and be well. Bye.